Zero red, minus five. Marking red plan. All units clear. Switch over to standby. Glastonbury with Crafty Cuts. He's about to play Arcadia tonight. Are you excited? I am, yeah, I can't wait. Blimey, after what I've just seen, pictures and uh, the stage, the setting, it's going to be crazy, I think. Have you uh, played it before? I have actually. I've done it at Festival twice and I've done it at um, Boomtown on the big one on the Big Spider. Do you, do you have to, because obviously you're enclosed, do you change your setup a little bit for that or how do you change, do you change how you play? It's going to be difficult because we're doing back to back with A skills, so he's going to be behind me, so it actually is going to be back to back. Oh, so do you, do you actually use both sets of decks? Because there was a couple of back to backs last night, and there was they were just playing off one, one. they were just facing one side. Oh, but... right, okay, that would be great if we could do that. So I'm going to go and have a look at the setup. But um, I've always done it by myself. I've done it once with Dynamite, and what was funny, Dynamite went into one of the little channels on the side through the glass thing, and that was just before General Levy, I remember that, or after. It was crazy and everyone was there and the place was just going crazy. That was a boom town. And uh, it's quite an enclosed sort of area, isn't it? Because it's like a little goldfish bowl. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you just kind of like in there, but when the lights are shining and the fire's going, that and you can feel crazy, the heat man. inside. That yeah. fire, they're saying something there's 60 feet fire last, from last night. No way, 60 feet. And when it goes, you just like, whoa, that's, some fire. that's a bit of heat. Christ, <laughs> man, it, yeah, it was good. Uh, and then, so lots going on there. And you've got a new album. I have, yes, with Dynamite MC called All Four Corners, and uh, I'm very happy with it. 14 tracks, various styles featuring like Rodney P, Foreign Beggars, Example, Harry Shotter, who's actually got the world's fastest um, rap in, in the Guinness Book of Records, and there's Rhea, who's a brilliant drum and bass singer, and uh, did I say Example yet? Yeah, so, yeah. and, and Urban Dub, brilliant drum and bass producer. So, it's a nice little variation of hip hop, trap. Broken beat, breaks, and funk. Nice. So you, uh, that's obviously four years since the last one. Um, did you, is it a kind of, was that a plan break or was it just sort of? Yeah, it was weird because I was like, I'll tell you what happened basically. I, when I wrote Let's Ride, I suddenly got so many gigs off the back of it and I was traveling the world doing so much. And then I started doing my podcasts and then other doors opened. So as a DJ, I became more busier than I'd ever been. And I suddenly just found myself touring and touring and touring. And I thought, you know what, I need to stop touring and I need to stop traveling so much. I need to go back and write some more music. And I started uh, writing an album with Dynamite and it's kind of a mixture of club and radio friendly sort of tracks. And it, I feel it just works. I, I, I just wanna, it's really hard to promote an album now. It's yeah. not like you used to, where you'd give it to a PR company, everyone would be excited to get stuff. People are just playing on their own music or it's really hard to get your music across because there's so much out there, so it's more difficult. It to seems to be it seems to be a singles game as well now these days, where you 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 might as well just put singles out because people digest it a bit quicker and yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, well, that, when I wrote the album, a lot of people did say to me, "Oh, you're mad writing an album. You know, you won't get much traction on it. People just didn't into singles or EPs." But I just felt like I had so much good music that I wanted to write that was inside of me. You do need money. You need a lot of money to promote an album. You need to do the PR, photo shoots, videos, um, and all your personal social media and stuff like that. It just takes forever. So I must say it has been really hard work. But things are starting to pick up now. And I'm doing a lot of radio, like Radio 6 last night. I'm doing a lot of big festivals this summer. And I've also done a lot of 
um, interviews recently, and obviously I've done an, uh, a mix that I was really happy with for you guys. Yeah, it was incredible, incredible, incredible mix. Really, yeah. Thank you. Very kind of you. Yeah, loads of loads of really good feedback for that. Um, and so just how, like this album process, was it a long like the writing was long and. Did it... um, Good question. It was it, it was longer than I anticipated. Like every album, you finish it. It took about a year to finish, and then suddenly it takes another three, four, five, six months to come out. So you're like, but yeah, I finished this mix, this album, six months ago, and the whole process of, of like you know, put the first single out, second single, third single, remixes, artwork, and etc. etc. That can take just as long as writing the bloody album. So it can be pretty stressful, but. You know, when I write my future stuff, I've got to think about this and put it all into perspective so that it doesn't take as long. Yeah, do you think you'll change how you go forward? Do you think? Absolutely, yeah. I make sure that when I finish the album, that all these things in the, pro in the future will be taken care of so that the process will be a bit quicker. So when I finish the album, hopefully people will get it like six weeks, uh, sorry, two months after I finished it with all the artwork done because um, I'm writing an album with Charlie Tuna now so I'm going to be doing like all the other stuff that involves with that so basically you know what I'm like I'm always thinking of one thing after the next so I really need to not do too much thinking and focus what I'm supposed to be doing. And, uh, and you mentioned you're working with Pretty Lights so is that? I'm doing a tour with him with Charlie Tuna we're doing three or four shows with him uh, in Seattle, Chicago actually remember is doing so many dates but yeah I'm looking forward to that because he's an he's an incredible artist his visuals are amazing his music very epic it's really like crazy so um, that's gonna be good fun and Charlie's obviously he's he's a big fan of Charlie Turner so that's how I got brought into that nice okay so and also like you tour loads man you um obviously I met you in New Zealand and that was a long you know a long time oh, ago awesome, but you, you just like you have I see you have a lot of reach in a lot of different areas and that's I guess I don't know where I'm going. I guess I guess how, do you work on that lots? Do you kind of focus on lots of you know? Yeah, that's that's a good point because the thing is, I I feel as an artist that if you like when when I first started, there was no social media, there was no kind of like you know you go on the internet and everyone would check where you are, what you're doing. No Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram, no Snapchat, no nothing. So it's kind of word of mouth and off of the back of people hearing your music like what I'd released and mix CDs people would go in and buy CDs so they would get into the shops so I've done a lot of traveling like America Canada New Zealand Australia uh, Indonesia Philippines Singapore Thailand so I reached all four corners of the world hence why we called the album all four corners and I traveled all those places and I felt that it was a really good stepping stone so that everywhere you went across the world some people would have heard of crafty cuts and I like the fact of going to all these places and meeting and educating young people, kids, and and doing seminars and and, and and workshops and and you know just increasing the the kind of movement of like the music that I played, and I think that that helped the development of Crafty Cuts in terms of like the worldwide reach, and so the foundations were laid so that people in those countries would have heard of me and thought, you know, oh yeah, I know Crafty Cuts, and they would have checked out your music. So when your name's mentioned in a conversation, or your music comes up on, on a mix, or, or whatever, people kind of know who I am. Whereas nowadays, it's quite easy for people, to, someone to be quite well known in terms of like their name, let's say in the UK, but like in, in, in the Philippines, or say Thailand, or New Zealand, they might not be as popular because they've never been there. Yeah, you see, you see, I see on Facebook a lot, and you see, oh, so and so's blowing up, so and so's blowing up. And you're like, are they really blowing up, or are they doing well in their little corner of the world? And really, they're not at all. They're just sort of, they're just blowing up in London, basically. Yeah. And, and, and you know. It's quite easy to get kind of like washed up in that. Yeah. And especially as the UK, we've got, we, we create a lot of styles of music and a lot of different sub genres. We're like, you know, like America. And, and Australia, I think, of, and, and France, the four big sort of places where, and Germany, five, that really develop like techno, house, drum and bass, dubstep, breakbeat, EDM, sort of style music in America. All this stuff is being pushed across the world. But like you said, someone, let's say, for instance, an EDM music in America might be massive there, but nobody is interested in the other side of the pond. And a lot, I've noticed a lot of Americans don't come to England and a lot of English DJs don't go to America because they're quite 
different scenes now. Have you noticed yeah, they, yeah, they are. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that like, EDM sort of died a little bit and trap sort of raised a little bit. But then I think uh, house music, I guess, is the same. It's sort of people travelling all over. But yeah, I mean, house music will always be, wouldn't it? It's yeah, like hip hop, hip hop, house, and drum and bass. They're safe. But all the other forms of music, a lot of um, people, like say in England, are not quite as into the whole EDM scene as they are in America. And if you go to let's say EDC. Vegas is like one of the biggest festivals in the world, like Glastonbury, but for just purely dance music. 300,000 people, as you know. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and that is a totally different festival to what we're used to. I think the only festival that I really know in another part of the world is Coachella, that kind of is like the dry, hot Glastonbury. And uh, I, I was at IMS recently, and they, uh, they had the um, uh, business report, and they, they actually showed an increase in sales for breaks. Music. Oh, that's good. Um, which is, yeah, obviously. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I've just been thinking about this over the last month and studying it, and I, th I actually think you're right because I got to play some shows in America, yeah. where uh, the people who do the EDC events, um, let, uh, they brought us out there, played a gig in Los Angeles, a compact, really popular, and I noticed like you know, the plum DJs, Martin Horger and Stanton Warriors punks label and instant vibes my label and in beat we trust in russia and you got the guys in spain these parties are all really busy like the spanish parties they're getting like anything from a thousand to five thousand people wow. the russians i went and played there last week there was like two thousand people there and some of the parties like like you know that some of the other pockets are doing and it is you're definitely right it's definitely and increasing it, is, it, is it new music or is it are you are you just playing you finding you're playing older stuff that you it is new music yeah there's a lot of really good stuff like martin Horger, for example his music is crossing over and, and a lot of like you know people like diplo and other house djs etc well diplo not Dominantly a house DJ, but even house DJs are playing like breaks, which is a brilliant sign because it means that it's getting noticed by big forms of genres of music. Yeah, yeah. And other DJs are looking and thinking, you know what, this works well in my set. And it's, it's just an 808 boom. You know, the 808 boom is back. There's no two ways about it. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I get uh, also like for me, obviously you're one of the for me, obviously you're one of uh, the really standout DJs. You know, you really work it. And I guess in this day and age that to be a DJ is just becoming more and more accessible and I think I think like I guess what advice would you have for young DJs that to make yourself stand out in a show like, you know as just you know you guys do I mean as an artist at Crafty Cuts I, I try to always bring in new flavors new styles and I try to make sure that my DJ sets are interesting and I think that in practice obviously playing every weekend really helps because it's like you're practicing all the time and that what you know like all the house DJs and drum and bass DJs that <clears throat> are really busy if they're playing so many sets they're just going to get better and better and uh, it's adding new flavors like the scratching to make propellers editing tracks and my advice to, to up-and-coming DJs is study the form of music that you're really into and know about that music say for instance like drum and bass or house or hip-hop those three genres very popular know the foundations and, and the beginnings of that music and also the middle and to where the present day is so that you're going to play some of the classic stuff that it grew you know like jamie principle and all the early house music and then all the early drum and bass tracks jungle and stuff like that to some of the new stuff you know for example drum and bass if you drop brown paper bag in the middle of your set or at the end of your set everyone's going to go mad and crazy yeah. and people go yeah great track as soon as they hear the it's just it, you know it's moments like that and it's knowing that forms of music and like you know pharaoh monch get the fuck up you know you drop that in the middle of your hip-hop set everyone's just going to go mad so it's knowing about the form of music that you that you're into and then you know you can make your own versions of those tracks you know a lot of house djs techno drum and bass djs they all make little edits or shorten their tracks so that they can play more of the bigger tunes that they've got if they've only got like say an hour set and and that's making that hour exciting so when you start everyone knows that it's you that's on the decks that you make that like boom as soon as you walk on stage and the end and you just look like you're having fun you're enjoying it and you know you know i'm not really a lover of getting on the mic and talking to the crowd and doing the one two three drop it like you know that's not my thing 
I know a lot of American DJs do it and it does hype the crowd up. There's no two ways about that and I'm definitely not going to knock it um, because there's some DJs who wouldn't like... All right, James. There's some DJs who would not like, you know, scratching in sets or, or too many vocals in sets. So it's horses for courses with all styles of music. So if you can get a little bit of middle ground of everything that you do, like if you're a techno DJ or house DJ, just know your equipment and your filters and and how you build things up and how you interact with the crowd and play those right tracks at the right time. For me, Fatboy Slim, <coughs> excuse me, is, is one of the best DJs that I've ever seen interacting with the crowd without getting on a mic and talking to them. He's just so brilliant about dropping a track at the right time, about caressing his music into the right crescendo and just getting everyone to love what he's doing and he always pulls out like a classic track or a track that he's redone or a new track that everyone's talking about oh did you hear that track that fat boy played and i remember watching him at the big big, big beat boutique in brighton and just learning so much about him and just how much of a brilliant nice fantastic dj he really is and then i'm watching like djs like jazzy jeff and grandmaster flash and you encompass some of all those styles into your set that's crafty cuts you know. Thank you very much. Mate, lovely to see you always, always. Really nice to see you. Data transmission, they got it going on. And thank <laughs> you for letting me put out my music on your, on the mix no and worries, uh, be dude. part of what it's doing. I've known this guy from day one and uh, he's uh, going on to bigger and better things. So thanks for everything, mate. No worries, man. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.